أرجو رضاك يا الله أنت الرحيم يا الله أبني عطاك يا الله أنت الكريم منك العطاء يا الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters let's continue our discussion on the inner dimensions of worship in respect now to the very important topic of Hajj. Let's talk about a little bit about the virtues of Hajj. There are many, many sayings of the Prophet ﷺ in respect to the virtues of Hajj, but let's just concentrate on a few. One is from Abu Huraira, that the Prophet ﷺ said, and he was asked, which deed is best? And the Prophet ﷺ said, belief in Allah and his messenger. And he was asked, and what after that? And the Prophet ﷺ said, jihad for the sake of Allah. And he asked, and what after that? And the Prophet ﷺ said, and accepted Hajj. And this hadith was collected by both Bukhari and Muslim. So what is an accepted Hajj, my dear brothers and sisters? May Allah have mercy upon you. Hajj Mabru'a, what is an accepted Hajj? Well, first of all, very importantly, it must be paid for with halal money. If the money that you're earning is haram, then unfortunately, everything you spend it on, your food, your clothing, even your acts of charity, they are not things that will benefit you at all. In reality, they become things that will harm you. So it is very, very important that the money that you use to spend for Hajj is halal. Number two, and this is also very important, and this is one of the greatest tests in Hajj, and that is keeping away from evil, sin, arguing, disputing, abusing and injuring others. I say this is difficult because the nature of Hajj brothers and sisters, the journey is long, the hardships are many. The difficulties are inevitable. And there are so many people gathered together in one place. It is very, very hard not to encounter situations and circumstances that you may feel like arguing. You might even feel like fighting because the situation could be so bad. But Hajj is the time that you should not get involved in those type of arguments and disputations and wrangling and bickering let alone other things like idle talk, useless talk. Now you should keep away from all of these things in your Hajj. Of course, that does not mean, brothers and sisters, that if you see an injustice, or you see some sort of wrongdoing, that you should not try to prevent it. But this is referring to any type of argumentation, any type of discussion or talk that is not necessary. So. This is something that you have to be careful of and that is something that's very difficult due to the nature of Hajj. So this is a real test of one's character. And I think, brothers and sisters, you'll understand that just by thinking about what might be involved in this respect, in testing your character, that the preparation for Hajj, in order for it to be successful, doesn't just start a few weeks before you leave on the journey. The whole of this journey is going to be a real test of your character. And if you have bad qualities, if you have unpleasant qualities, if you're an argumentative type of person, almost definitely those qualities are going to emerge during this trip. So brothers and sisters, this is the importance just as subhanAllah the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we've talked about in previous episodes how his state would change when he heard the call for prayer, how making wudu, how so many different things prepare ourselves for the prayer and that we should be prepared for the prayer long before the first takbir. Similarly with Hajj, we need to start making the preparations mentally and spiritually if we want our Hajj to be accepted a long time beforehand. Also, of course, very importantly, Hajj should be done purely and sincerely for the sake of Allah, not for reputation, not for fame. In many countries, a person who has made Hajj is given a title, Hajji, as a title of respect, 
So brothers and sisters, we should be very careful. We are not performing pilgrimage so that when we come back home, people are going to respect us. We are treated with a certain level of dignity. No. Hajj should be done purely and sincerely and completely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, brothers and sisters, do not nullify your Hajj by following Hajj with acts of disobedience and sin. Hajj is a great opportunity, as we will see, for having yourself purified of sins. So therefore, why would you want to corrupt and destroy that by straight away after Hajj, going back into sin and disobedience to Allah? What are some other virtues of Hajj? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does Hajj for the sake of Allah and does not have sexual relations, commit sin or dispute unjustly during the Hajj, that person will come back like the day that his mother gave birth to him. This of course means, brothers and sisters, without sin. We believe in Islam that every child is born upon the fitra and every child is born sinless because sin, by definition, is the purposeful intent to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a child is pure and sinless. And the book of deeds is open for this person to be written good deeds or bad deeds. So brothers and sisters, of course, you do not lose your good deeds, but you will, inshallah, after Hajj, lose your bad deeds. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, Umrah is an expiation for the time between it and the previous Umrah. And an accepted Hajj is no less a reward than paradise. So again, this is in Bukhari and Muslim. So the reward for a Hajj is accepted is paradise, brothers and sisters. This implies that a Hajj that is accepted will affect a person's soul profoundly for the rest of their life. And if Hajj does not affect you that profoundly for the rest of your life, this perhaps is an indication that your Hajj was not actually accepted. Ayesha said, O Messenger of Allah, can we not go out on campaigns and fight jihad with you? Ayesha, she was asking this question in respect to women. So the Prophet ﷺ said, but the best and most beautiful of jihad is an accepted pilgrimage. And Aisha said, I never stopped going for Hajj after that, or I never heard, stopped going for Hajj after I heard that from the Prophet ﷺ. This is narrated by Bukhari. This indicates, brothers and sisters, that Hajj is a form of jihad. Jihad does not mean, as some people wrongly say, fighting and killing and blowing people up and things like that. This is not jihad. The word jihad in Arabic means to struggle to the utmost of your capability. Anything that involves a struggle for the sake of Allah, whether it is an inward struggle or whether it is an outward struggle, this can all be referred to as jihad. So especially this is the case for women that hajj is a big struggle, it is a big effort for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has referred to hajj as a jihad, meaning in the broadest sense of that word, jihad. And subhanAllah, Amr ibn al-As, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, hajj wipes out any sin that comes before it. And that was collected by a Muslim in his sahih. In another narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Keep on doing Hajj and Umrah, for they eliminate poverty and sin, just as bellows eliminates impurities from iron and gold and silver. So, brothers and sisters, what is the process that usually metals are made pure? They are heated, ore is collected from the top because it gathers on the top and it's scraped off, and then even it is hammered and beaten and then melted again. So all of these things help to purify the metal. So Hajj has a similar effect in removing poverty and removing sin. So that is something that is encouraged, therefore, to repeat 
your Hajj and Umrah, insha'Allah, as much as you can, if possible, because it has that benefit. Alhamdulillah, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. And Ibn Umar reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the one who fights for the sake of Allah and the pilgrim who goes for Hajj or Umrah are guests of Allah. He called them and they responded. And they ask of him and he will give them. So this is another great benefit. When you are making Hajj, you are a guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is hearing you and He is going to answer your dua, insha'Allah. And this is especially true of Yawm al Arafah or the day of Arafah, as we will talk about shortly. So it's very important, brothers and sisters, to know the benefits, because if we know the benefits of any given action, it helps to motivate us and it helps to guide us as to why and for what reasons we should be doing that action. We're going to take a short break, don't go away. We'll be back again with further discussion on the inner dimensions of Hajj. of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Jabir bin Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, reported that the Messenger of Allah, may peace be upon him, said, The similitude of five prayers is like an overflowing river passing by the gate of one of you, in which he washes five times daily. Sahih Muslim, Volume 1, Book of Salah, Hadith Number 1411. Let's come under the shade of the scholars. So the issue is a problem of knowledge. Asim Al-Hakim. Why do people do bid'ah? Imam Malik said, whoever claims there is a good innovation in the deen. Salim Al-Amri. He is accusing that Prophet Muhammad did not convey the message. Dr. Mamduh Muhammad. If you know that the Prophet ﷺ did something and I do something else, you have to follow the Prophet ﷺ. Don't follow me. Abdul Rahim Makati. But if each one believes his goal is to please Allah, to follow the Sunnah of Rasulullah. Abdul Rahim Green. I think this really is to do with your internal state. Where does the Quran and Sunnah point to? Muhammad al Sharif. Let's imbibe from these scholars the fruitful solutions for the problems of the world. Which one we would take and which one we would leave? Question to every Muslim. To every Muslim. In the shade of the scholars. Next on Peace TV. Asalaamu As Alaikum, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our discussion on the inner dimensions of worship in respect to Hajj. Let's talk about some of the benefits of Hajj and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Hajj in the 28th ayah that they may witness things that are of benefit to them. So in reality, one of the very purposes of Hajj is that the human being can actually witness things that are of benefit. And there's obviously two types of benefit. There's worldly benefits and that there are religious benefits for people who go on Hajj. Of course, amongst the benefits we have already mentioned is that a person's sins will be forgiven, that they will go to paradise, but there are also huge rewards. Just praying in the Kaaba itself, SubhanAllah, has a huge virtue. In fact, the virtue of praying in the Kaaba in Mecca is 100,000 times the prayer anywhere else. 100,000 times, mashallah. This is the huge virtues of praying in the Kaaba in Mecca, subhanAllah. And in fact, all the good that a person does is amplified there. But it's also important to notice that all the evil that a person does 
is also amplified there. This is due to the status of Mecca. This is due to the status of the proximity to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In any situation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects us to perform on a higher standard in respect to our deeds, the consequences of failing to do that are more. And there's many examples of that. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expected from the companions in respect to the degree to which they should follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not the same as what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects from latter generations. That is because those who lived with and they experienced the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how they should be motivated and how that should affect them is by necessity much greater than those people who did not have that experience. The virtues of Ramadan, the benefits of Ramadan are much more and the expectation therefore, because the shaitans are chained, because the gates of paradise are open and the gates of hellfire are closed, the need and the expectation upon you to do good deeds in that time is much, much greater. And brothers and sisters, we could think of many, many other examples similar to that. Another one that just comes to my mind is that the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will treat an old man who commits adultery is not the same as the young man who commits adultery or fornication. Because when a person becomes old, their desire decreases. Therefore, for a man at that age to persist in this act of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala incurs more of the wrath and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point being here, brothers and sisters, ultimately, that Mecca is a place of huge virtue. There is the house of Allah. This should create within the person. This is the inner dynamic. It should create within that person or more reverence, more love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and more fear of Him due to the proximity of His house. So alhamdulillah, the virtues of Mecca and praying there are great, alhamdulillah. So this is an opportunity that you don't usually get at any other time. And then there are certain rituals like making tawaf and sa'id. It's the only place where it can be done. Drinking the zamzam water, actually you can carry it anywhere. And I suppose people can bring it from Mecca and you can drink it. So that is not something that is confined only to Hajj, but certainly the extent to which you can drink it, the way you can wash yourself in it, and of course the day of Arafah, all of these things, the stoning of the Jamrat, all of these things we'll be talking about them. And all of these have an inner dimension, brothers and sisters, which we'll be talking about. So the benefits of Hajj, many of them are very, very particular to Hajj. Of course, another benefit, from Hajj, which could theoretically be gained in other places, but it's something that is much more emphasized in Hajj, is the benefit of meeting many Muslims from many different lands, witnessing and experiencing the truthfulness of what the Prophet wasallam said, that Islam will enter every country, every city, every town, every village, every home, although it may not be the case yet, that Islam has entered every home. This is what the Prophet said, and it will definitely happen. But we can see that Islam is in every country, and you will experience people from all over the world, and it's such a beautiful thing to see that all of these people from every culture, every language, every country have come to this one place to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Also, there is the benefit of sitting with scholars and the people of knowledge because Alhamdulillah, it's one of their habits. Many of them I know personally, many scholars who make an effort to make Hajj almost every single year, subhanAllah. And so there is a great benefit in meeting and discussing and learning from these scholars. It is a fantastic opportunity for the Ummah of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam to meet and discuss all the issues that are affecting the Muslim world and for people to share knowledge and share information. And this used to be the habit of the people of the past that they would use this opportunity to discuss the affairs of the Muslims during Hajj, subhanAllah. So let's begin to talk about, brothers and sisters, 
the spiritual effects and benefits of Hajj on a person. There are many rituals and behind the rituals are many wisdoms. So Alhamdulillah who is ever blessed with a proper understanding of them is going to be blessed with much goodness. So as we have heard before, understanding is an important component of being able to really internalize and appreciate and bring to life these actions of ibadah. So first of all, let's think about the travel, brothers and sisters. SubhanAllah, whenever we travel, we are reminded of our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we get upon our riding beast or we get in our car, we say all praises due to Allah or far removed from imperfection is Allah who has subjected this to our control and we never could have done it on our own. And certainly to our Lord, our cherisher, our provider is the return. So this is the reminder whenever we are traveling that we are returning to Allah. And our whole life indeed is a journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the journey of Hajj should allow us to reflect on the fact that our whole life is a journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when we journey, what do we do? We leave behind our friends, we leave behind our family, we leave behind the comfort of our homes, all the things that are familiar to us, Subhanallah, this is a great hardship. In our locality, it's easy. We know where is the local shop. I know where to get the food that I want. I know where is the doctor. I know where to find the medicine. I know if I need help, I have my neighbors, I have my family, I have my friends. This is the beautiful thing about living, Subhanallah, in your home. Yet you leave all of these things. Maybe people used to travel through so many lands, not just one land through so many different lands, unfamiliar lands with unfamiliar languages and unfamiliar customs. So all of this is very discomforting for the human being. Human beings generally, you know, they like what is familiar to them. This is why, for example, you know, people like McDonald's and Starbucks and all these chain stores, Nike and Adidas and all the rest, not that I mean to advertise any of them. The purpose I'm just mentioning familiar brands. And what do you find? The way their stores are designed, the way their restaurants are, is the same because you can go anywhere in the world and you step into this familiar environment. And people actually like that. They like that familiarity. It gives them, you know, a sense of security. This is how human beings are. So this journey alone is a very, very challenging experience and it is like what is going to happen after death. You can read as much as you like about the torment in the grave. How do you think the reality of the grave is going to be in comparison to reading and studying about it? How do you think the reality of the day of judgment is going to be in comparison to reading and studying about it? How is the paradise going to be? How is the hellfire going to be? in comparison to reading and studying about it. So the reality of this journey into the Akhirah, the reality of this life in the grave, the day of judgment, the paradise and the hellfire, this is our journey, brothers and sisters. This is the journey. is going to be very, very different to whatever we have read about it. So it's the same with our journey on Hajj. You know, just as our journey through life is full of difficulties, trials and unfamiliar situations, so will our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be like that. So we should be reflecting upon these things during the Hajj. Now the one who goes on this journey equips themselves with enough provision to help him reach, not only to help him reach the sacred land, but also brothers and sisters, they need enough provision for their family that they should leave behind. Again, all of this should be a reflection on our journey to the Akhirah. What do we need on this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We need good deeds. We need righteous actions. We need to somehow have earned or facilitated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows His mercy upon us. This is what is most important, inshallah ta'ala. So we should take provision for this journey on Hajj. We should not have to rely upon begging with others. If we take 
things in order to do business. There is no harm in doing business. That is one of the worldly benefits you can get from Hajj is doing business, but it should not be your intention to make Hajj in order to make money. If you make money or you take stuff with you in order to do business so that it will help you in your provision during the Hajj, this is fine. But you should not have that intention or this should not be your main motivation to go on Hajj to do business. Why? Every action is judged by its intention and you only get what you have intended. So brothers and sisters, we will continue this discussion in the next episode. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu, Allahu, ya Rabbi, ya Allah, Allahu, ya Rabbi.